let's look at God's Word in the Scripture. And uh, I've already worshipped this morning. I hope that you have sensed that as well, too. But I shared this uh, with Brother Donnie. And so he's got it up on the screen there for you. But let's look into John, the 21st chapter, a familiar passage. This is after Jesus' uh, resurrection. And as the Scripture says, he appears to the disciples this third time. And so if you would, in honor of God's Word, if you're able to, stand. And I'm going to read uh, God's Word for us this morning as we share together. I'll be reading from the NIV version of the Scriptures this morning and preaching from that. John 21, beginning there in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that is James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, that is, I believe John, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire burning coals, and there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come, have some breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Cast your net on the right side. Henry Blackaby, in his study, I hope that you've experienced that, experiencing God already, he says, uh, find out where God is at work and join him and join him. I've learned to do that, and I think the disciples were in the process of beginning to learn that for themselves as well, too. You see, Jesus said to the disciples, they didn't know who he was as he was standing on the shoreline, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Now, I want to do a little play in words this morning as we think about this particular passage together. Was he talking about the port side versus the starboard side? If you're not a fisherman, if you're not a boat person, that means the left or the right. You see, these were fishermen, skilled fishermen, and they had fished all night long, and so they were approaching the shore, 100 yards out, and about to come in and clean their nets, and they were done. They'd fished all night long. But their boat was empty, and their nets were empty with no fish. Were they fishing in the right place or the wrong place? That's what I want to pose this morning as we think about that together. You see, have you ever tried to do something on your own and you discovered that you were just spinning your wheels uh, like a merry-go-round that was going around and you couldn't get off and nothing was happening? You know, maybe you have sensed that aspect of where your net has been empty and you've caught nothing. You know, no traction, nothing. These were Galilean professional fishermen, every one of them. We don't know the other names of the other two, but the ones that we know, we know their background if you've studied Scripture. So I kind of related that in three illustrations that I want to share with you this morning very quickly to kind of focus in 
on the whole aspect of what is going on at this particular point in time. The first thing is, uh, years and years ago, when we first moved back from Indianapolis, Indiana, and the Lord called me in the full-time ministry, I was music and youth at First Baptist Church of Branson. And so I'm sure some of you visited down there, uh, Taney Como, I love to fish for trout. And I was fishing on Table Rock, and there were numbers of times that I would be out in my boat, or my friend's boat, I didn't have one, still don't have one of that caliber. But I was out on Table Rock, and I can remember getting there early in the morning and fishing right up until noon, and it was like I was just beating the water. I could not catch a largemouth bass, you know. It, it wasn't because I didn't know how to fish. It was because maybe there was the wrong time or the wrong place. But then the Lord allowed me to come in contact with a pharmacist that worked at Walmart at that particular time, and, and I got to know him, and so he said, well, Rodney, I'll take you fishing on Table Rock at nighttime. He said, this is what you need to do. This is the lures that you need. And uh, meet me at a particular dock at this particular time, 1030 at night. Can you imagine that going bass fishing at 1030 at night? But he had all the right equipment. And he knew exactly where to go. And he told me the right lure to use. And so we went out. And I guarantee you that when I was able to see the edge of the bank and drop my lure right on that edge, <laughs> and began to retrieve that back into the boat. A big old bass grabbed that, and a few times I didn't even have my drag set tight enough that I could hold that fish and get him into the boat. I mean, we were catching all kinds of big, largemouth bass because this guy knew when to go and where to go and the right bait to use as well, too. On Table Rock, another experience, uh, my pastor and I, uh, got to know the superintendent of the school system there that was retired at that particular time. He grew up in the area when it was just White River Valley. And he knew exactly where out in the middle of the lake. And so he said, here's what you guys need to do. Go to Walmart, buy a one ounce Dixie Jet spoon and make sure that you have 12 to 15 pound test on your poles. And so bring them with you. And so we went with him and way out in the middle of the lake, I would not have been fishing out in that particular circumstance in the middle of this huge lake. And he said, here's what I want you to do. As, as far as you can, just cast that jet spoon out there and let it sink and give it about a 30 count. Now, some of you are fishermen. You know exactly what I'm saying. Others of you think, what in the world is he talking about? But that's what we did. And so we threw that Dixie jet spoon out there, and, and I counted down 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And then he, start, he said, just start reeling. Bring it up and reel, bring it up and reel. And those bass, you see, they were on the top of those dead trees that were way down deep in Table Rock. He knew that those bass were hovering around there trying to catch minnows. And when they saw that Dixie Debt spoon coming back by, they thought it was a minnow out there in the water. And they would come up out of that tree and grab that thing. And it was a fight. It was a fight. The Lord has allowed me last Wednesday, I flew into KCI. Geneva came and picked me up. It's my 16th time, a boyhood dream of going to Canada, fishing. But you know, every time that I've been up there, and this last time, the Lord blessed me because there was a gentleman that I got to know. I had known him for about five years now. And so it was since it was probably my last time that I'll be able to go to Canada, I wanted to stay over with him and meet his wife and let him take me walleye fishing. Now, Shoal Lake is where we were in those other times, and so we would catch northern pike. Northern pike is like dragging a log in. I got tired of that. But the smallies, I really love to catch smallies in Shoal Lake. But once in a while, even though we couldn't target them, we would catch a walleye. We couldn't keep them because of the laws and the circumstances there. But he said, now, I will take you back to Manitoba when you stay with me those two days, and I guarantee you that we're going to catch a lot of walleye. So that's what happened. That's what happened. Altogether, I caught 92 fish this last time that I was there. Not bragging, but I want you to know. You can pat me on the back later on. <laughs> but I had the opportunity now going to Manitoba and letting him show me where to fish and how to fish 35 walleye. 
I caught a master. That doesn't mean anything to you probably, but in Canada, it means a lot. It was 27 and a half inches long, 27 and a half inches long, a walleye. And there we could keep them. And so we, there was a slot limit and we kept a few. And then while we were fishing for walleye, the, his son in a boat caught a walleye and I hooked a bullhead. Any of you ever caught a bullhead? But this one was 15 and a half inches long. A bullhead, 15 and a half inches long. And that was a master. So here's my story. I've caught two masters in Canada in 2023. But I say all of that to say this. Jesus knew the right place and the right time. The right place and the right time. So I'm going to reflect on three simple points as we think about that this morning. Who was this guy? They were standing on the shore, and he had enough boldness to say, because they already knew, Jesus knew, they didn't have any fish in the boat, and their nets had been empty all night long. So he said to them, Cast your nets on the right side of the boat. On the right side of the boat. Seven tired Galilean fishermen fishing all night long. And Jesus said, friends, haven't you caught any fish? We'll try it on the other side. You see, a guy who knew exactly where the fish were, it was obvious as they cast their net, the scripture says there in our text this morning that there were large fish, large fish, 153. You know, and I've read some commentaries and some people have reflected upon that, but one that I picked up on, which I think is probably very realistic, why did the scriptures have 153? Well, supposedly there's 153 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. Now gather that. But then on top of that, large fish. In Canadian understanding, master fish. Every one of those were big fish. I don't think these fishermen had ever had an experience like this before. 153 fish, maybe that was a total species in the Sea of Galilee. And large fish on top of that. What an experience. Their nets had been empty, but Jesus knew where to fish. Hey, folks, he brought those fish right there in a pool. Because fish don't school together like that. That's totally unusual. 153. Peter had said, I'm going fishing, and the other disciples said, we'll go with you. How many times have we fished all night long and caught nothing. Caught nothing. You see, we wear ourselves out until we consult the master fisherman. Until we consult him. Listening to him, and here's my second point, obeying him. You see, these disciples could have missed a blessing. They didn't know who, who was on the shore asking them and telling them to cast it on the right side of the boat. They could have said, hey, buddy, we fished all night long. We're professional fishermen. Who do you think you are? But they listened to what he had to say, and they obeyed him. And they obeyed him. And in the process, they discovered, John did, hey, Peter, that's the Lord. That's the Lord who's told us to do this. And look what's happened as our net is completely full. So the second point is they obeyed the master. They obeyed the master. You see, they could have missed that blessing. But instead, out of obedience, their net was full. Their net was full. To the point of not even breaking as they pulled it into shore. Did it make any sense? Absolutely not. I mean, if you're a fisherman, this makes no sense whatsoever under these circumstances. But they obeyed what the master said, and they were faithful to what Jesus had told them. You see, the master fisherman 
If we listen to him and we obey him, time and time again, he will fill our net. He will allow us to bring the fish in that we need to bring in for his honor and for his glory if we will only listen and obey his word, his commands, the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, Geneva and I, because of retirement and uh, supplying around, we have the opportunity to visit a lot of congregations, especially in the St. Joe Baptist Association. But I want you to know that there is a spirit of the Holy Spirit among us today Amen. as we've gathered together. I, I sense that. I really sense that. Uh, Donnie, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, picked out some songs this morning that just really touched my heart. And I hope it's touched your heart. Because we have the opportunity to listen and obey the words that the Lord Jesus Christ is sharing with us. And that's what we need to do faithfully and obediently. And that's exactly what Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples did on this occasion. So John said to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter grabbed his outer garment and wrapped it around himself. I grew up as a Boy Scout. Matter of fact, I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm not really proud of the Boy Scouts anymore because of circumstances. I'm not going to get into that this morning. But I had the opportunity to work at a camp in mid-Missouri where I grew up. And I was on the waterfront and I taught life-saving. I taught some kids how to save themselves if they accidentally fall in the water full dressed and all those kind of things. And I really still don't understand. I'm going to ask Peter and the Lord when I get to heaven. Peter, why did you put an outer garment on and jump in the water? You just normally don't do that. But Geneva shared with me one time, well, I think, uh, Rodney, it might have been out of respect for the Lord Jesus Christ when he realized this is the Lord. And so I'm going to present myself in a worthy manner. I hope that you've come this morning and worship, and you're ready not only to listen, but that you might also honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Your deacon, as he prayed for the offering this morning, touched on my last point. That's of the Holy Spirit right there. You see, what has the Lord told you? Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. The Holy Spirit is dealing with you right now and saying you, list, you need to listen to the truth that you've heard, however it's come to you, that you're a sinner in need of Christ as Savior. And if you only reach out by faith and accept Jesus, the work that he did on the cross as he died for you, my friend, just like he died for me. And by faith, ask him to come into your heart and into your life. You can become a believer today. But this message is really for us as believers this morning. Are we continuing to listen to the Master? Because he knows where the fish are, and he knows the right time to do it, and he knows exactly what you and I need to do. I was reminded of some Old Testament personalities. You see, God told Moses, throw down your staff, I'll take care of you. He told him through the burning bush, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And as Moses listened to God, as Abraham listened to God and was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac there on the mountain, and God had a ram already prepared in the thicket. You see, God and Jesus Christ have prepared all those things for us. He prepared that whole situation here on the Sea of Galilee and perfectly brought those 153 fish together and cast the net on the right side, and the fishermen drew them in. What's the Lord told you recently that he wants you to do? I don't know how he's spoken to you. I know he has spoken to me. He spoke to me already this morning through the music. But the most important thing is that we listen to him and we obey him faithfully and obediently. About a month and a half ago, one of Geneva's good friends in Maysville died of cancer. But I can remember back in 2006, she came and worshiped with us. I didn't know her at all. I won't mention her name. 
But she started coming to the revival that week. I don't remember the evangelist's name that we had. But I noticed that she was there and uh, she was sitting by her husband who had already been worshiping with us for a while. So it was the first opportunity for me to meet her. She came back the next night and she said to me in the foyer before the worship service started, Brother Rodney, the Lord convicted me last night and I want to make a decision for him and I can't wait for the invitation. Can you believe that? I said, great. You know, I've got the first thing on the, on the platform, you know, welcome and, and letting everybody know what the revival is and all that kind of good stuff. So I got up there and I said, uh, there's a young lady here in our congregation tonight that's convicted of the Lord and she can't wait for the invitation. So let's take, have an invitation right now. She popped up, walked down to the front and I joined her down to the front. She gave her testimony. You see, she was a Christian, but she'd been walking away from the Lord. And so she began to come back to the church, and God and the Holy Spirit convicted her heart, and she was excited. I bet she couldn't even sleep that night before and couldn't wait till the next night to come and make that decision for the Lord. And I tell you what, folks, before her death, she shot off like a rocket and was growing and deepening in the Lord. It was sad to lose her, but she went home. She went home victorious. Wow, what God can do when we listen to him and we obey him. And there are some here this morning that need to do exactly that. The Holy Spirit speaking to you. Maybe as an unbeliever, maybe as a believer, maybe someone that accepted Jesus at camp years ago like these young people. But you walked away from the Lord. You're back in the world. And he's calling you. He's standing on the shore, my dear friend. And he's saying, I want to fill your net once again. If you just listen and you'll throw your net, not on the wrong side, but on the right side. On the right side. You see, Jesus produces the right results. And that's my last point as I close. He didn't need their fish. He already had a fire going and fish and bread already prepared. But you know, as your deacon prayed this morning, he invites us to join him in his kingdom's work. Wow, what a privilege. What an opportunity. He's got all the fish in the sea. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, as Corey Ten Boom would say. So let's just go butcher one. Let's just do what God wants us to do. What does God want you to do today, my friend? And I close. Are you tired of fishing all night long and not accomplishing anything? Listen to him and obey him. But here's the point. Are you ready now to make the next move? When we stand in just a moment, and we have that song of invitation. Will you be like our good friend during that revival? Pastor, I can't wait for the invitation. And pop up, walk down to the front, and greet one of these deacons that are going to be here. And let them know and let them pray for you. Accepting the Lord as your Savior, or rededicating your life, or faithfully walking for the Lord. Is he speaking to you today? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the opportunity to come and share with these folks today. Lord, I pray that you have spoken to people, that we've been open, our eyes have been open, our ears have been opened, and we know that you are speaking to me personally. Help us to take that next step as we've listened now help us to obey and follow you faithfully and obediently. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, and amen.